The Ministry of Secondary Education has developed a distance learning platform for students of secondary education in Cameroon. A series of lessons taught by qualified teachers for secondary school students. Under the stewardship of Professor Pauline Nalovalyonga, in collaboration with the Ministry of Posts and Telecommunications, CAMTEL, CRTV and UNESCO. We are introducing distance learning as another teaching and learning method which is different from the traditional classroom setting that you are all used to. In the distance education mode, you are not with the teacher in person, so take your time, relax, listen to the teacher, take down notes and visit the following links for any questions or answers to your questions. Take it in your stride. This is Cameroon's solution to COVID-19 and beyond. Professor Nalova Lyunga, Minister of Secondary Education. Welcome to our lesson for today for Opposite Science Biology. I am Tanboy Frederick, your online biology teacher. In this lesson, we shall be looking at the concept of sexual reproduction. And what actually is sexual, we shall look at the details of it, and we shall give a lot of examples in this lesson. What is the plan for our lesson? After looking at the objectives, we shall talk a little bit about the previous knowledge that should enhance our understanding of this lesson. We shall give a hypothetical real-life situation. We shall look at lesson activities, and then have some exercises, and of course, an assignment which we can do after this lesson. But before we proceed with this plan, it is imperative that we do the correction of the assignment we had in the previous lesson. And this stated that we should give one reason in each case in answering the following questions. And the first one was, which method of reproduction produces identical offspring and is the most successful in a stable environment. We had the alternatives of asexual, sexual, conjugation, and inbreeding. So which of them is the most plausible response? If you did it correctly, you would have realized that the best response amongst these is asexual, because asexual reproduction produces identical offspring. And for this to happen, the environment must be stable with enough nutrients for it to be able to replicate the genetic material so that the younger ones or the new generations can be produced. The next question was, which of the following statements is false? And the first was, budding is a method of asexual reproduction. Fragmentation is a method of asexual reproduction. Parthenogenesis produces diverse offspring, and binary fission is a method of asexual reproduction. Remember, you are expected to give the statements which is biologically false. And if you did it correctly, you would have had C as the correct response, because parthenogenesis does not produce diverse offspring. All the offspring are the same, and even of the same sex. The third question required, required that there was an observation with sea stars, and when they are broken apart by the workers to save the other organisms like clams on which the sea stars feed on, and then when these pieces were thrown back into the sea, maybe just for them to get rot, they later observed that the number of sea stars instead increased. Then what could be a reason for such? And we had alternatives of regeneration, fragmentation, budding, and the presence of suitable conditions. So which of these is the most plausible response for this question? You would have realized that it is regeneration. And the reason is that regeneration means that if you cut an organism into two or more pieces, each piece, instead of dying, will develop the other parts that are missing to form an entire organism. Therefore, when these workers cut the sea stars and threw back into the water, 
Each part will develop the part that is lacking, and each part will develop the part that is lacking. If we have the example of cutting one sister into three and throwing the three pieces into the water, what then happens? After a while, you have three sisters which have developed. Therefore, the number will increase. That would have been the most plausible response. I hope you got it. But what actually do we want to achieve from this lesson? By the end of this lesson, we should be able to describe the concept of a sexual reproduction and at least three stages of sexual reproduction. We should be able to compare and contrast internal and external fertilization. But to enhance our understanding, we are expected to have an understanding of the reproductive process in plants and animals. If you don't have it, it is imperative that you read about this so that you can easily understand this lesson in its entirety. Now, what is an example of a real life situation? in which this knowledge from this lesson could solve. There's a hypothetical one here, which states that after being told that his little sister was developed or was delivered at the maternity from his mother's stomach, this young boy also observes and notices that the mother's abdomen had reduced in size. This implies that the mother was pregnant, but the little child now came and then the mother's abdomen was reduced. So the boy was very curious, and he wanted to know how the baby got into the stomach in the first place. As a biology student, how can you explain this to this young boy? So let's see how the knowledge of this lesson will help us to explain to this youngster how the baby got into the mother's stomach. From this hypothetical situation, what could be our observation? A scientific observation is that human babies develop in the female's abdomen and then are delivered. A hypothesis from this could be that only female humans have the potential to give birth because this baby did not develop in the father, but it was in the mother. So that could be a hypothesis. And this is our alternate hypothesis. It is important to recall that there are two broad types of reproduction in living things. We have sexual and asexual. Asexual involves a single parent, while sexual involves the male and the female parents with the fusion of gametes. Let's look at these pictures that we have here and try to describe them briefly. What is happening? What do we see? Even without judgment, what are we seeing here? And in so looking, we have to reflect from the biological perspective what might have been happening. Here, we have a mother duck that is leading the young ones, implying that these are certainly its offsprings. We have a snake here, which is coiled around its eggs, meaning that it has certainly laid these eggs and is protecting the eggs. We have a flower here, it looks like a lily flower, and then we see that these things that I touch here, when you shall go further, you see that these are the anthers, and in the middle here, we have the stigma. The stigma is usually the female part of the flower, and then we have two birds here, these are hormone birds. We see that they are as if they are kissing, <laughs> so this is what we commonly call courtship. So it does not only take place in humans, but birds also undergo courtship. We shall look into this detail, but we have to explain this from a biological perspective. Now, in sexual reproduction, this actually, there is the genetic material which comes from two different parents. And the cells which actually combine are what we call the gametes. And these actually combine to produce an offspring. Therefore, it implies that even including humans, for sexually reproducing organisms, there is a combination of what we call sex cells. And for the female, it will produce the egg, 
why the male would produce the sex cell, which is called the sperm. And when these cells have the chance to fuse or to merge together, then what happens is the process we call fertilization. Fertilization, therefore, is the fusion of the male sex cells to the female sex cell, that is the sperm to the egg. Remember, it is the sperm that moves to the egg. So it is the sperm that fuses onto the egg, not the egg fusing to the sperm. We have to take note at this point. Therefore, when this fusion occurs, a new cell is therefore formed, which is called the zygote. And this would obviously be diploid because these gametes had haploid number of chromosomes. And when the two fuse, then the number of chromosomes double so that the offspring which is formed is diploid, what we commonly call 2N. Therefore, in sexually reproducing organisms, all zygotes would be diploid. And these diploid zygotes will then develop to form the, 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 the adult organism with all the body parts developed and intact. But what actually is the word sex? We have heard and seen sex could be contextual in that it could be a verb and it could also be a noun. But from the biological perspective and for the essence of this lesson, we shall consider sex to be the biological differentiation of organisms into males and females. And to be a male or a female, there are both internal and external structures that make such differences. In that said, sex plays a key role in sexual reproduction. That is, sexual reproduction comes from the word sex because of maleness and femaleness of the parties involved. And we should note that this takes place in both plants and animals. It is not only animals, but plants also reproduce sexually. Then, with sex gametes, with sex organs and gametes that we have seen, what actually is found inside these gametes are what we call genetic materials. We could have what we call a DNA, and in subsequent lessons, you shall actually see how these sex cells are formed in detail. But for now, genetic materials are those plant or animal materials Maybe it could be of microbial or other origin, and this carry inherited material. And this material can pass from the parent to the offspring. And when it is able to pass from the parent to the offspring, we say that it is hereditary, meaning that it is inherited, what comes to you from your parents. And this material contains information, which now is also passed to further generations and generations upon generations. That is why we can have what we call a family tree, which has certain traits that have been moving from the grandparents, great great grandparents, until the present generation. That passes through genetic material. And it is this information that actually controls reproduction and the development of the offspring. For gametes, <coughs> these are actually cells of organisms, individual cells. Gametes will be a single, if we have one gamete, maybe a sperm or an egg, it will be an individual cell. One cell will be either a sperm or an egg. We shall look at these details in subsequent lessons. But for gametes to be formed, the male produces the sperm, while the female produces the eggs, or what we call the ova or ovum for one. And these are different from body cells in that. For body cells, if I take myself as an example, any cell in my arm is a body cell, or what we call somatic cells. But if my body produces sperm, those sperm will be sex cells. And somatic cells will be deployed in genetic composition. They have a double number of chromosomes, while the sex cells will have a haploid number of chromosomes. So the way in which the somatic cells are formed is different from the one in which the, ga the gametes are formed. Because gametes are actually formed by a process we call gametogenesis. And we shall look at it in detail in subsequent lessons. In these gametes, normal gametes are actually produced by meiosis. 
it is because meiosis 1 and 2 lead to the reduction of chromosomes. And if they are abnormal, then remember, we will refer to parthenogenesis. And these can be produced by mitosis, as we had earlier described, and in so doing, the gametes will be diploid. Therefore, if these diploid gametes happen to fuse again with an egg, then we have what we call polyploidy, meaning that the zygote that develops will not only have the diploid number of chromosomes, but can have a triploid and even quadruplet number of chromosomes. That is what we call polyploids. In this polyploidy, you will have the chance to learn it in detail in genetics. But for now, we have only the introduction phase of it. Then, what types of organisms do we actually have? Terminologically or epistemologically, we have dioecious organisms, and these have the male and female reproductive organs in separate individuals. E.g., like man, you have the bird, you have tilapia, mackerel, and many others, where you actually have an individual male and an independent female. We also have monoecious organisms, and these have both male and female reproductive organs in the same individual. This can be found in snails and also in hibiscus. It can also be find, found in pine. So we shall look at this in a short while. We also have hermaphrodites. And who are hermaphrodites? In this situation, the ovaries and testes are found in the same animal. Remember, the ovaries produce the egg and the testes they produce the sperm. But if they have, happen to be found in the same animal, we call those organisms hermaphrodites. And these are commonly found in slow or sessile organisms, such as earthworms, such as hydra, the snail, and a host of others. And in these organisms, there is what we call cell fertilization. It occurs, but in very rare situations, meaning that although these organisms have both male and female parts in one body, and they produce the sperm and the egg, an individual organism will not simply just transfer the sperm to fertilize its own eggs, but it will be two different organisms that will do an exchange. But it can still occur, but it is in very rare situations, implying that more studies are still going to actually see how it occurs. We have an example here of the earthworm. When we look at the structure of this earthworm, we see that this is what we call the clitellu. And when you shall look at the detailed structure of the earthworm, you see that it has the genital opening. And there are two genital openings, the female and the male. Each earthworm produces a sperm and the egg, but will not self-fertilize. What happens then is that during the breeding season, two earthworms will come together and they will join these reproductive openings. From one earthworm, it will send the sperm into the other earthworm and also receive the sperm at the same time from the other earthworm. Therefore, there is exchange of gametes. As earthworm A gives the sperm to B, B at the same time also gives its own sperm to A. So you see that there is no self-fertilization. This is crossing, but we call it ex exchange of gametes since both share the gametes. This occurrence takes place in garden snail because the garden snail too are hermaphroditic and they have both sperm and the egg, but when they join the genital pore or what we call the genital opening, there is exchange of gametes. Therefore, the offspring or the zygote that will develop will be diploid and the egg and the sperm would have come from different parents, not from the same parent. So these are common examples that we can have in our environments of these hermaphroditic organisms. But how does this sexual reproduction occur in lower organisms? This takes place in the form of conjugation. When we talk of lower organisms, we simply mean organisms whose tissues are not yet advanced. They still have rudimentary tissues, such as hydra and other microscopic organisms. Now, when we talk of conjugation, what happens? We shall be looking at the example of maybe spirogyra, which is common in our environment, and we shall see that during conjugation, the two strains will come together. Remember, we have also seen in Hydra 
And height also has body. So you should not be confused when we talk of body and we talk of conjugation and all of this. There are a variety. So we have to be specific at this point. When the two strains come together, there is the exchange or the transfer of genetic material. But there is actually no male and there's actually no female. We have good examples in bacteria, in paramecium, in spirochera, as we are going to see in a short while. This is the scan picture of spirogyra undergoing conjugation. From this, we see that if we look at these dark round things here, these are the zygotes. And if you look at this particular cell, you discover that this one is empty, while this one has genetic material. It implies that when they came together, they formed what we call a conjugation tube. You can see it here. And from this other strain, the genetic material, the nucleus, it moves through this conjugation tube into this other cell here. And while they fuse here to form the zygote, at the same time, they also form a thick wall, which we call the zygote or around it. And we should take note here that this sexual, this form of sexual re uh, reproduction here in Spirogera is termed rudimentary because it takes place during harsh conditions when maybe the pond is getting dry or towards the dry season and water is very limited. And when these zygotes are formed, they will develop a thick wall around it. And then these can go through the period of the dry season without dying. And when the rainy season comes, these zygotes falls, they will germinate and form long strings of the organism. If it is this our spirogera, it happens. And then you have a lot of spirogera within the next season. But during the dry season, you wouldn't see it because the conditions were not favorable. But it goes through that harsh conditions in the form of zygote spores. Then, what actually is self-fertilization? Because we have said that hermaphrodites do not self-fertilize. Self-fertilization here, we imply the situation where both gametes come from the same organism. And in cross-fertilization, we imply a situation where the gametes come from one of the two separate individuals. One actually gives the sperm to the other. Even if you receive the sperm again from the other, that is cross-fertilization. Then, there is also internal fertilization. And internal, as it means, implies that this sperm fuses with the egg inside the body of the female organism, not outside. And in this situation, the male uses a specialized organ to deposit this sperm into the body of the female. And this process is what is called mating. And during this process in which the sperm will move from the male to the female using a special organ, it is not just taking place anyhow. There is a procedure, especially for what we call advanced organisms. Advanced here is not in terms of human development, but in terms of biological development of the body of that organism. And we have a good example here. We can see in this picture two hummingbirds. They are like kissing. This is not different from what we humans do. So this is the process that takes place before there is the mating. It means that they, this process stimulates their reproductive organs and then they are able to, the male is able to transfer the sperm into the female. It is equally the same thing in dogs and in man. And this is generally called courtship, meaning that there is courtship before mating. We also have oviparous animals. What does this mean? This refers to egg-laying animals. And in these animals, the eggs are fertilized internally, just like in humans. But these eggs are covered with a shell. Like you have the, the, the eggs of birds that we buy every day and eat. And then, these eggs, when they are laid, they hatch under certain conditions. They do not hatch inside the body like in the humans, but they hatch outside, and the conditions have to be provided. And this is what is called the incubation period. This commonly takes place in reptiles, in birds, and some insects. Now, viviparous animals are those whose eggs are fertilized and retained inside their female bodies. And in this situation, the embryo is nourished and develops within the mother. This is a good example that takes place in man. Remember, 
our case, we had a real life situation where a young boy discovered that the mother has gone to the hospital and delivered a baby. And he was wondering how the baby got into the mother's abdomen. We are now seeing that humans are viviparous animals because fertilization is internal and the zygote develops within the body of the female. And such organisms usually will show a lot of parental care to ensure that this young develop. Like is the case with us humans, then we can see in elephants, in dogs, and many other organisms we find around us. There is also one called external fertilization. How does this occur? In this situation, the sperm and the egg are released into the environment, maybe into the water, and then by chance, the sperm will meet the egg and they can fuse. You can see a situation here of two amphibians where the female, which is below, lays eggs into the water, into this jelly uh, coat, and then the male is above spraying the eggs with sperm. And when it sprays, some of them can fertilize the eggs and they will develop. This is external, meaning out of the body of the mother. We also have <coughs> an isogamy where the male and the female gametes differ from each other. And this differential is in structure, size, and even behavior. And they can be produced by both dioecious and monoecious species like we have seen, like the sperm in humans. So we are, there's an isogamy that goes on in us. We also have isogamy, where the male and the female gametes are in the same structure and size, but they differ in function. We call the male the positive strain and then the female the negative strain. And we understand that biologically, the male strain donates while the female strain receives. And these examples are, could be found in bread mold, which is done during conjugation. Remember in our activity, we have seen this duck that was leading the young. In this duck, there is internal fertilization which takes place, but the eggs are laid to hatch outside. And then, on, during this incubation, which is about 28 days, they then hatch to young ones. So this is the condition we describe as oviparity, as we have seen. We also had these hummingbirds, which are doing courtship, which is prior to mating. It's the same, similar thing that occurs in those humans, and even dogs. Then we have this flower, which is a lily, and this flower is hermaphroditic because it has the anthers that produce the pollen grain, and it also has the female, the pistil, which is seen outside here by the stigma. So the pollen grains will move either by insects, by wind, or whatever it means, and they can get attached to this stigma. And when they get attached to the stigma, that's what we call pollination. Then they will grow in what we call a pollen tube and eventually fertilize the ovary or the egg, which is inside the ovary, right down. We shall look at this in a short while. So this is hermaphroditic because it has male and female. Then, our real life situation, we were talking about a young boy who discovered that the mother brought the baby and was wondering why the mother's abdomen reduced in size. And his question was, how did the baby get into the mother's stomach? With this knowledge that we have had of this lesson, how could we respond to this infant? You will discover that our scientific observation was that human babies develop in the female stomach and are de delivered. We have seen it clearly that when the egg in humans is fertilized, the development is integral and they are only developed when they are mature to a certain level. Therefore, humans undergo viviparity. Then, our hypothesis was that only female humans have the potentials to give birth. We have seen that in female humans, the egg is fertilized and returned in the uterus. But is it only in female humans? Dogs equally do that. Elephants do that. And many other animals do that. The embryo develops fully and is born with all the parts complete. That is why that baby was born in the hospital and the baby came with all its parts because of this reproductive process. Therefore, our hypothesis that babies uh, fed with milk from the mammary glands and we observe, tells us that these humans, human males actually lack the uterus. They do not have the mammary glands and therefore they will not be able to have pregnancy. They do not have the uterus where the baby develops. 
Therefore, our hypothesis is uphold. Who will accept it? Because only females will do that. We will have one short exercise, which is to give a schematic description of the life cycle of the human being. And it goes as follows. We have the adult who is deployed, will produce the somatic cells by mitosis, but these cells in the gametogenesis will produce the sperm and the egg by meiosis, and they will all be haploid. And then, if these fuse, they will have fertilization will occur, and a zygote will form that is diploid. This zygote will then grow to become an adult, and the cycle continues. Therefore, when we have the sperm and the egg, those are the gametes, those are reproductive gametes, the gametophyte, which takes place. Then, the haploidy and the diploidy are understood. We have one short assignment, which is that you will be expected to harvest a flower of your choice, anyone that you can find around your environment. You observe it keenly, and then you identify and keep the functions of all the reproductive parts that you will see in any flower around your environment. So that in our next lesson, we'll be able to use it and to explain further how plants reproduce. These are some of the references that we have consulted for the production of this lesson. And we have come to the end of our lesson. Our next lesson, we shall be talking about pollen and ovule formation in plants. See you in our next lesson. Ona tege minga matege nyum Ona tege majang matege ndom Mane tambia ninya ne njubia yen Ngani bana matege mot Ngani lakiri watege ndong Esa kina bia jinkido Mane tambia ninya ne njubia yen Tam tama mote tam zabike Tam tama tonge tam zabike Tam tam tama mote tam zabike Mane tambia ni